Inaugurated in 2005, the Salle de Concert Grande Duchesse Josephine Charlotte, built in Luxembourg, designed by the French architect Christian de port -Zampart. It was on the Kirchberg Plateau, a new district for European institutions and banks, that Luxembourg decided to site this cultural facility. It was built on the Avenue Kennedy, the main road of the district, where the architect responsible for town planning had designed a large triangular area paved with black granite. With its rounded shapes and its whiteness, the Philharmony building contrasts with the parallel pipettes of the neighboring concrete and glass buildings. The shape of the central building that houses the main concert auditorium, administrative offices and rehearsal rooms is defined by two large curves to make an ellipse that has two points, one to the rear of the place, the other towards the avenue indicating the entrance to the Philharmony. Two smaller volumes like white shells adjoin the main building. In the heart of a new district stands a new monument. The architect who won the competition in 1997 is Christian de Pauz en Parc. He has just completed the Cité de la Musique in Paris. He built the French Embassy in Berlin and a tower for Louis Vuitton in New York. In 1995, he became the only French architect to be awarded the Pritzker Prize. Install something in the middle of this place, I thought to myself. We have to enter into another world with the world of music. I had a childlike idea of creating a center that would be something other and to surround it with a screen of trees to pass through. And then I realized that there is not enough room to place a screen of trees. There is a parking lot underneath, all rather tight. So the idea of a screen was transformed in the idea of a filter, and that was to become the skin of the building to pass in or out of. The 20 meter high facade seems to be uniform. It is made up of 827 steel columns, 30 centimeters in diameter, all identical. Their positioning is varied. According to the place, two, three or four ranks are ranked in successive curtains. Taking a turn around the building, they seem to be spaced at random. The facade opens, then closes, and at some places provides a glimpse of the interior. According to the orientation and placing, the filter is opaque or transparent. Sometimes it lets the sun in, or some views. Sometimes it closes the foyer in on itself. But it is not just a visual game. Some of the columns are load-bearing. They hold up the roof. Others ensure air conditioning and the circulation of air. Some house cables and pipes. One of the ranks holds the glass partition that separates the interior from the exterior. It is a wall, but a wall unlike other walls. Here the functions are broken down by the architect according to the positioning of the columns. Where it faces the Avenue Kennedy, the spacing between the columns is wider, that is the main entrance. The audience comes into a large reception hall where they can wander around, a public area inside the building, protected and filtered. This is the foyer. Here the audience assembles before or after a concert and during the interval.
It is a high and empty space that goes all around the building. This monumentally sized peristyle is surprising by its gentle rake that invites you to wander. You On know Goethe's saying that architecture is petrified music. In fact, I think that saying is ambiguous, because music is essentially evolving, transforming, in movement. I don't think that architecture is petrified either. It's an experiment with time. And suddenly, it's like that that I saw the relationship with music, not petrified music, but architecture that is movement, just as music is movement. In the middle of the building, the architect placed the most important item on the program, a shoebox. The brief for the main auditorium was precisely a concert hall of the shoebox type, which means quite simply a parallel pipette. Where the architecture of concert halls is concerned, that is a safe bet acoustically speaking, inspired by the famous Musikverein, built in Vienna in 1870 and considered to be one of the three best music rooms in the world. At first sight, the response to the programme of the Luxembourg Philharmonie is in its simplicity. 1,400 seats raked on the same axis as the stage. But the side walls are festooned with strange volumes, defined by chamfered corners and oblique lines autonomous volumes that seem to be independent of the walls and ceiling, each with its own orientation. The architect has broken up the sides of the auditorium into four towers. They are reunited by a partition in concrete that, together with one box to house the control room and another for the stage, create an enclosed volume. The simple shoebox shape is invisible behind the complexity of these singular and zigzag forms. The shoebox is a reference. It is a proportionally rectangular shape. But we couldn't keep the sides parallel because of the echo, which persists indefinitely. So we had to have indentations and angles in the side walls. That's why the towers are oriented to allow a view of the orchestra. The public surrounds the orchestra like a sort of vertical seating plan. We put the people one above the other, and all of them will be in the first row. It's also very important that the musicians should be aware of the faces, eyes and ears all around them, very near, and for whom they are playing. During building, before the roof was finished, we had a real impression that they were like little houses built around a square, rather like a mythical image, like a Shakespearean theatre, trestles up in a square with people in front and others watching from the windows of the surrounding buildings. A long spell of computer modelling with the help of the acoustician Xu Ya Ying made the main auditorium into an acoustic masterpiece. Acoustics is a discipline that covers music, architecture and physics, at once empirical and sophisticated, which has to take account of the methods of propagation of sound, as well as the absorption and resonances of each of the materials used. Each calculation is different according to the wavelength and complicated by the dimensions of the auditorium and the time taken for the sounds to travel. Every detail counts here. From simple choices such as the glass panels that reflect the sound and instantly images towards the back of the auditorium, or the wooden backs jutting out from the seats and sending the sound to the sitting spectators. absorbent black curtains between the towers, and the oblique shapes to help the audience members on the balcony to hear better.
there were more sophisticated choices for the petitions in relief whose widths and depths improved the absorption and diffusion of sounds. <laughs> or the movable plates on the ceiling that combine with the plaster reliefs at random. The hall is like a musical instrument that can be tuned. The acoustic can be altered to suit a cappella voices, a jazz quartet, or a symphony orchestra. They tell how during one of the first concerts, the conductor invited the acoustician onto the podium and complimented him like a great soloist. That was in recognition of the acoustic qualities of the venue. Indispensable and invisible as they blur into the choice of the architect, his plastic sense and his ideal vision of the relations between audience and musicians. The two sets of door with the compartment between them that insulates the auditorium from all exterior noise are reached by a bridge used as terraces and galleries, a metaphor for path and mountain. 250 metres long, supported by slender pillars, it spirals around the central area, emphasising the dynamics of the curves and the different levels. It was originally intended to be made of metal, but for reasons of economy, concrete was used instead, whose solidity enhances the elegant curve. Following the curves of the colonnade, it traces a continuous line along the variations of the relief on the facade of the main auditorium that presents alternating planes and hollows, coloured reliefs and high white sides. This succession of cliffs and rifts conceals the volumes of the towers and spills into the foyer. Espousing the rhythm of these protuberances, it is a plaster decoration, a new landscape attached to the volume of the towers from which it is sometimes separated by several metres. It is a trompe-l'oeil by which the architect modulates the variations. Between each cliff, the rifts are in all the colours of the rainbow in pastel tones. There you are welcomed, attracted, repelled. You are in a multi-purpose area. A succession of ever differing phenomena. Door, window, entrance, descent, bridge, big rift, small rift, oblique, vertical, light. All that is a secondary movement but extremely important because it characterizes the venue. For me, something that I've always thought, without looking anywhere else, in architecture, that is what you discover in walking. You discover it with your feet. You discover it in going through the sequences. Here I play on a continuous event. Between the ranks of the columns that create rhythms of shadow and sunlight and the layout of cliffs and rifts, moving through the foyer becomes an experience, a way of finding one's own movement, an architectural pleasure.
In the competition entry, the architect had put the administrative offices on the roof of the building. In the course of the technical studies, he developed the theme of cliffs and put the offices in four towers oriented towards the southern point of the Philharmonie. As if one building contained the other, nested buildings in which the offices had a second chance for daylight and landscape. On the top level, the architect created a terrace that benefited from the zenith sunlight from above the roof. Held up by the concrete walls of the main auditorium and on the metallic columns of the filter, a steel framework supports the roof. By following the line of the auditorium, the architect designed a narrow skylight to let the sun in on the rifts and on the foyer. It underlines the very pure design of the whole of the roofing and shows the refusal of symmetry of the project. The main auditorium is not in the centre of the building. Curious white shapes are set beside the central edifice and its columns, mysterious volumes that dialogue with the great filter, and house the chamber music auditorium and the box office. Separated from the central building by a narrow canyon, the box office presents a glass wall to the colonnade opposite. The chamber music auditorium faces a curved blank wall. The competition brief did not define requirements for the chamber music auditorium. The architect took up and enhanced a proposal that he had formally made in 1993 for a music room at Nara in Japan. The idea is surprising. His inspiration was the Moibu strip, twisted and joined to form a single surface, whether inner or outer. The idea of the Moibu strip is to have a form that envelopes, but is mysterious, without an axis of symmetry, to avoid what is called focalization. I mean, to avoid what is produced by a cylinder or a cone that sends back all the sound's energy on the same line in the room to the detriment of all the other sounds. I was interested in avoiding the defects of the shoebox, the box in which you are fixed in place with its organised character, its central aisle, all in geometrical and hierarchical order, which I think is a drawback, because sound is multidirectional and because you want to be able to listen with your whole body to have a perception in which imagination can work better and where you can forget that you're in a fixed point in space. In the end, in an imaginary way, the body enters into movement with the music. It's a bit like Okuzai's great wave. I mean, you don't know whether the space continues on elsewhere. There is an inside, but there is also an outside, which is part of the inside. Like a blade, the leaf that defines the white volume outside pierces the foyer and makes the entrance to the chamber music auditorium the only thing that disturbs the alignment of the columns. You penetrate the obscure entrance of a cavern.
The little room holding 300 people is a warm area with wooden walls. The inclined ramp also serves as a balcony looming over the rows of seats in the stage. There are no right angles. Everywhere is curved, leaning, oblique. Each wall seems to have a movement of its own. The curve of the white wall of the chamber or the slant of the thick side panels. Above the stage is a plaster shield weighing more than a ton. It's there for acoustic reasons, it diffuses the sound, but it's also a plastic element. By arresting the movement of the walls, it becomes a visual center of gravity. is a jewel box in which the architect unites the constraints of the acoustic, decorative necessities and the demands of the architecture. But most of all, he gives each spectator a wealth of visual sensations to accompany the movement of the music. Obedient to the constraints of the program, the architect abandoned the pared down design of a unique volume defined by steel columns. One might think that putting the chamber music auditorium and the box office outside the main auditorium is a compromise, kissing goodbye to the initial design. Nothing of the sort. The movement of the two white shells dialogue with the great white filter and its curves. Opacity facing transparency. From this confrontation comes curiosity and the desire for movement. Christian de Porzenbach wanted to make his building a flagship, a reference for the Kirchberg district that was deserted once night fell. Following the work started at the Cité de la Musique in Paris in 1990, he incorporated primary colored triple neon tubes in each of the riffs that were programmed to change color through the whole spectrum from red to violet and not forgetting white. This movement of color continues to amplify the movement of the shapes and gives each of them an elan that makes architecture an art of time. <laughs> 